Today I am up in Wild and Woolly, Topanga Canyon, California with my friend David Hamilton, who is a screenwriter, and we met in the movie business, but David is a passionate gardener. And we're gonna talk about the challenges of hillside gardening in a wild place like Topanga. And coming back after four years of being away, and what you found and how you're going to reboot your garden. Yes, it's a challenge. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to cover that in a multi-part series and I hope you'll stay with us. <laughs> David was just telling me, now you know I fell a couple times in the last few months and David was just telling me. Yes, that when you, you'll see better when we go up in the garden, but it's on all sorts of different levels. And I was telling you to be careful when you go up there and don't, don't trip on the steps. Don't fall over this, the side of one of these bins that's coming out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, if you've been following me for a while, you saw my England videos, and when I first arrived in London, David and Janet's rented cottage, really, was mm -hmm. uh, my first stop. And so if you go back and watch those videos, you get to meet David and the cat, and uh, not this dog. Yeah, he oh, was Oh, this there. dog too. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there was another okay. dog as well. <laughs> anyway, I thought we'd start by uh, talking about how long you've been here and uh, when you got involved in gardening and all that. Okay, well, I've been here uh, over 20 years, except for the last four years when we were abroad. I got into gardening decades ago. In my former house, which was in Beverly Glen, I had okay. another garden that was up behind the house, up a series of stairs. And so I've been in gardening since my 20s, really. Wow. My late 20s or 30s. and. It's always been raised bed gardening like this. What are some of the challenges that you found in gardening in Topanga? Well, the first challenge was the location. As you <laughs> see, it's it's on a hillside, so it had to be it had to be platformed up. And also the heat in the summer in Topanga. It gets very very hot here. Now, this is a very different microclimate from where I am, just yeah. down way down there. <laughs> yeah, cuz we're at 1000 feet. Okay. Here, maybe a thousand one hundred eleven hundred feet or so, but it's hot. It's in the summer. It's over a hundred for weeks and weeks and weeks. Oh wow! And so, do you have some respite in the mornings and the afternoon? Uh, yes, and that's usually it's either in the morning or afternoons when we water late afternoon, or in the middle of the night yeah. to water to make sure there isn't anything lost to evaporation. But you love it here, right? Oh, I, I absolutely love it, and I'm so glad to be back. And, and no one has used the garden in the four years we were gone. So the earth is, is fallow, fundamentally. David and I actually met uh, at a reading of a play that I did, and we just hit it off. And when they decided to move to England to work on his movie, David had me up to see the garden and asked me if I would take care of the garden while they were gone. Didn't you think you were going to be gone a year? Yeah. <laughs> one right. year <laughs> that's right and I got up here and it was such a different climate I wasn't used to a hillside garden and there were other things that I found challenging and for whatever reason we decided not to right to do it and then the uh, various renters didn't uh, want to work on it either yeah they didn't I mean some things were planted apparently um, there were tomatoes and other things that were grown, but it wasn't like I had it, which was six discrete beds in all slightly different uh, formats. One had strong shade cloth over it for gourmet greens, and it was all greens. One was all strawberries. In this climate, and probably in the Palisades too, you can have a winter garden and a summer garden. Right. And the winter garden usually was the gourmet greens and broccolis and those kinds of things. David has all of his garden under netting. Yes. And talk about why. Okay, there's, there's a number of reasons. Underneath the earth in each one of the beds is what's called construction cloth. 
Hardware cloth. Hardware cloth. Yeah. Which, and which bef when the beds were made, it was laid down before anything else. Right. And that keeps the gophers from coming up. So you have gophers. I definitely have gophers, have rabbits, and have squirrels, both of which are the, the devil's minions who, who will eat everything and anything. So that's why the side of the garden is netted and the top of the garden is netted against birds. Right. And so the only negative would be the netting is can keep some of the pollinating insects out. But the bigger butterflies. Yeah, the bigger butterflies, but but that's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Everything still gets pollinated. And so the focus on these terraced sections here which are not covered are going to be for your pollinators basically, right? Yes. You're going to be he's growing salvia of course, citrus trees and lavender. You're just getting started filling Right, because all of this died when we were gone. Yeah. And so this is all, we just replanted all this. And yeah, but then within the garden as well, I'll have flowers that will attract pollinators mm -hmm. and flowers that will attract beneficial predators. Let's talk about predators. Okay. <laughs> what predators do you have up here? Well, they're mountain lions. They're coyotes. Okay. Lots of coyotes. In fact, this little peninsula of land used to be called Coyote Point. Bobcats. But these are all predators that don't hurt the garden. No, no, They're I the don't. ones that keep down. You know, they eat the rabbits. Oh. They eat your pets. <laughs> yeah. But rabbits are another evil, you know, of the garden. That the ra I think the rabbits are really the worst. Really? And that's why on the edge of the netting, the netting is dug in deep with metal rebar at the bottom of each piece of netting, which um, stops the rabbits from getting under. So uh, it's about that that deep below the uh, earth. Right, right, you have to. Oh, well, then red-tailed hawks are predators. But those are these are all beneficial predators. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because they take care of the rodents. Yeah, but insect predators, what I have did for years and years with my daughter is in the spring, when the tadpoles would come out and uh, in the creeks around here, okay. we would go down and catch tadpoles we would raise frogs and toads in an aquarium inside and they would become her pets. And we would take the frogs and toads and put them in the garden where they would live. And we would make little fairy houses for the frogs and toads. But did you have a water feature? Yes, each of the six beds, I would always have a, a pan of water with rocks oh, in it. So, I see. And that's also good for insects. And so that's what I would always do. Right. So, I would import beneficial non-insect predators, but then would also import praying mantises. Luckily, I have neighbors that will catch the praying mantids on their windows. Oh, there's one. And they would call me up <laughs> immediately. It's a friendly place up here. It is. <laughs> but some of the things that we're going to be talking about coming up in our series, which the series basically is getting started. That'll be part one. And then part two is planting and seeing the plants come to development. Mm -hmm. And then part three will be harvesting and sharing the harvest. Well, and let's also do a compost. Oh, segment. we're gonna talk about compost. Yeah, because I, love, I love compost. I love composting maybe even more than gardening. I know, he's really into composting. And what just happened, some of the people were adding to your compost when you were gone. Yes. And his gardeners last week, they dumped the... Yes, and so there was a lot of not really compostable things that were put back in the garden. So the beds are really messy right now. And also the earth is sunk because earth will compress. sink. Yeah, yeah, will compress. Right. And so as we were talking about, we're gonna have to put, we're gonna have to raise the level of the earth. Right. So our mandate is where do we find good organic soil? Well, one thing we can do is we can go to the bottom of the hill and buy a bale of alfalfa. So alfalfa is better than straw? Yes, because straw has seeds, or some straw can have seeds. Yeah, and don't forget that biodynamic compost is often made with alfalfa. Uh huh. It's extremely nutritious for horses to eat alfalfa. Normally, what would you, how would your composting process go? Well, normally it's all vegetable food scraps. I would just layer, I have three compost bins. I layer those with um, I put a few sticks, like the alfalfa thing you were talking about, on the bottom mm -hmm. to help with aeration. Mm -hmm. And we'll seed the, 
we'll see the bins mm -hmm. and they have air that comes in the side so mm -hmm. a layer of that a layer of earth mm -hmm. um a layer of of uh steer manure or chicken manure organic and then i just keep layering those three things oh and i water each one and that's what gets the manure is what gets the heat going and these beds are amazingly productive yeah. i mean i get hundreds and hundreds of pounds of tomatoes out of just the tomato bed it's incredible yeah it's amazing if the soil is right it's all it's all the soil right well it's a good thing you're really into compost yeah but when I was talking about the alfalfa, I thought we can put that directly on your bed. Yeah. You know, and then layer the compost on top of that. And That sounds like a really good idea. Okay, I just put down 2,000 red wriggler red worms, and then there were 500 additional worms that came with this particular deal, and uh, which I always put live worms into the garden every year. And because they process the soil and, right. and the worm castings are, some of the best, as you know, right? nutrition and that you could put on a garden. And if you just put them in there, they do the work. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll we're do gonna that. do a lot. We're gonna have a lot of fun. That is great. <laughs> well, it's lucky we're gonna do this. It's gonna make the whole process, which can be involved, so much better. I'd like to shine light on these little areas that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I look forward to it. in my England video. She was. She's in the thumbnail. She's international. International cat. This one would be a good one. That I'll, one's I'll have be... that one next. Okay. Mm. I love orange juice. Okay, I hope you enjoyed part one of our journey to make over David's garden. Come back and see us in part two when we get busy with the compost and digging up the beds, right? Yep. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like the video and share it and we'll see you in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please watch these. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And I'll see you in the next video.